Greetings, everybody, and welcome to PopStream, the shiny new streaming channel from your friends at Pop Culture Classroom and Denver Pop Culture Con, where your community comes together to talk about your media because this is your pop stream. I'm your host, Matt Slater, and I'm thrilled to be bringing you episode one of the PopStream Workshop, the once monthly pop stream show where professionals from the community are going to conduct demos and workshops to help you build your skills. So, whether you're looking to become a professional in the arts or trying to find a new hobby, or maybe just looking for local artists and organizations to support, the PopStream Workshop is the place to be. And joining me for every episode of the PopStream Workshop is the magnificent man behind all of your favorite convention panels, Mr. Bruce McIntosh. Bruce, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I thought you were referring to someone else all the second. All the oh, second. no, that's you, dude. <laughs> magnificent, okay. Yeah, Bruce, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, I am the uh, programming director for Denver Pop Culture Con when we get to eventually have it. And uh, meanwhile, we're producing things like this um, to keep everybody excited and into their pop culture faves. Uh, my history is I've been doing this for 10 years. Before that, besides some other jobs that are a lot less interesting, I've been uh, <laughs> doing the... The con for 10 years before that, I wrote uh, articles and a book about comic characters and their origins and in the past and their histories. And so I've been uh, pretty much steeped in comics for most of my life. Nice. And, you know, I'm going to we're going to learn lots of fun things about Bruce as we go on. But I'm just saying, if you find Bruce on IMDb, he is there. So go check him out. Um, so this is still a new channel. Let me give you a rundown. 
PopStream is coming at you every week with a collection of four rotating weekly shows. So last week, we kicked things off with episode one of PopStream Comics, where you got to know myself and the PopStream Comics cast, and we talked all about the Umbrella Academy. And this week, we're continuing with episode one of the PopStream Workshop. And then over the next two weeks, you can look forward to episode one of the PopStream AV Club, all about film, TV, and video games. And then episode one of Denver Pop Culture Con Flashback, where Bruce and I are going to highlight some of the very best panels from Denver Pop Culture Con's past. And then the next week, it's going to start all over again. So you get brand new episodes of the Pop, of PopStream Comics, the PopStream Workshop, AV Club, and Denver Pop Culture Con Flashback. So PopStream is live every week at 4 p.m. on Thursdays on our own YouTube and Twitch channels, as well as the Pop Culture Classroom and Denver Pop Culture Con YouTube, Twitch, and social media channels. So if you're watching live, you actually get to join the conversation via the chat. So no matter what platform you're on, uh, drop a comment and say hi to us. And in fact, in today's episode, live viewers get a very special opportunity to be a part of the show as our guest Dustin, who we'll introduce in just a second, will be taking live recommendations from the chat to include in his demonstration of how to create unconventional superheroes. So please look forward to that later in the show and get some ideas ready. But if you can't tune in live, that's fine too. You can always catch up with episodes on demand on YouTube. And as of today, we are available on podcast services. So if you'd prefer to listen to us while you're going through the drive-thru or while you're at the gym, you can find us by searching PopStream on Spotify and Stitcher. And we will be coming soon to other podcast services such as Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. But that's enough about the show itself. I want to dive into it because today we have an awesome guest with us. So we are joined by artist and Denver Pop Culture Con alum, Dustin Resch. Dustin, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you guys? I'm awesome. I'm so glad to have you here. You've got some awesome artwork. If you're listening to the audio, uh, Dustin has some really great artwork behind him that I hope you guys can uh, find on YouTube later. But Dustin, why don't you go ahead and tell us just a little bit about yourself? Who are you? What do we need to know? For all this audio audience, I'm going to be drawing as loud as I can, just so that you, know, you hear some some <laughs> we'll narrate in the drive through. Um, so yeah, I'm born and raised in Denver. Um, I ended up finishing school out on the plains out in uh, Bennett, Colorado, and uh, came back to civilization after. But um, I've been doing uh, graphic design, web design for many, many, many years. But I've been wanting to get all the way into art the whole time. So um, I went to animation school. Uh, in Denver at the Academy of or at the Art Institute when it existed and got an animation degree. I hate animating and uh, it turned out that I, that's where I found out I loved illustrating. Okay. Con concept art and storyboards and things like that. But it and, took the uh, degree to realize that animation was not, yeah, not the it was, future for you. I loved all the instructors I had. It was totally worth it. I ended up going back and teaching there for a while too, which is what got me to go and pursue grad school. And I ended up doing that um, my master's in children's book illustration because that's my my big dream is to tell stories of, of my own and to illustrate. Um, so some of the stuff that you guys are seeing uh, behind me, and I'll show you a little bit more. Which, uh, by the way, Ansley on YouTube says those pictures are awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm still trying to get uh, get my first agent, get my first publisher. I, I self-published a book long ago um, that I'm not showing anybody. And, uh, <laughs> but I've been working hard uh, in the industry and then, you know, going to workshops and conferences and things like that, networking. Um, but yeah, I've also, uh, I do a lot of portraits and, and superhero stuff, which is why I've, what I've been doing at the con all these years. I, I missed the first year, but I've been an exhibitor every year since then. And I really missed it this year, it turned out. Like, I, I missed all the people coming up and talking to me while I draw them. So this is going to feel like an hour of sitting in my booth. It's going to be great. I mean, that's why we're here. We're trying to have those con conversations, right? And, right. and reach out to that audience and still engage everybody. Um, so I want to know, and Bruce I know, wants to know lots of things about you too. Let's kick it off to you, Bruce. What, what should we, how do we pick his brain first? I, and by pick your brain, I do see that brain uh, bandana you got there. That's awesome. Well, he tempted me now to ask him about what his favorite sport is. <laughs> So yeah, if you weren't, uh, before we went live, we were talking about how uh, this may not be our sports audience. So yeah, <laughs> Dustin, what is your favorite sport? Uh, it's, it's just throwing up my hands and giving people my lunch money. That's the whole thing. <laughs> um, yeah, honestly, in school, I 
forced the school to allow a letter in Knowledge Bowl. So trivia is my sport. Awesome. Um, knowing stuff is my only sport. I do a little Taekwondo, but not on an athletic level. Just on a, trying to, you know, stretch out and not fall down. <laughs> I really miss geeks who drink. Do you ever do that? Absolutely. Yeah. I, Geek Bowl has become a real big thing. I got on a, a, a team. I've been to the last two, like, uh, that's Geek Zoo Drinks National Competition. Right, right. And uh, I've gotten really involved in the, the trivia podcast community, and I've done 30-something episodes, like competitive episodes of those. And so it's a huge group of my friends are involved in that, and I, I see them. We got to do one Geek Zoo Drink Geek Bowl this year, and when they uh, introduced it on stage, they said, welcome to America's final public gathering, because we were it was the end of February. We were just <laughs> finding out about covid and that's the last time any of us saw a human ever again. <laughs> yeah, I felt that way at, at C2E2 in Chicago. That was yeah. like, this is the last one for a long time. Yeah, this is in Chicago too, actually. It was fantastic. Um, but yeah. Um, Bruce, have you ever done Geeks Who Drink? Um, we used to do it when we first started the con. That's kind of how we got out into the public and, and told everybody about uh, we were there and you should come and you should be part of this too. And that's where we got a lot of our artists in Arby's Valley. Nice. Let's get a team together when we can. Let's uh, yeah. go back out and do that. Yeah. <laughs> so Dustin, what kind of art do you do? Because behind you, I see a lot of different styles of artwork. What would you say is your wheelhouse? Um, I've done a lot of training in, in portrait and caricature, um, which is what got me started on all the stuff that I was that I do and sell at the at the cons. Um, so humans are my favorite thing. And then, you know, animals, but I also, uh, I'm obsessed with the ocean, always have been. And so I've got a, one of my children's books is uh, about an octopus that I actually, like it was, it's a true story of a thing that happened on my first night dive down in Cozumel. I think he's off screen the way that the boxes work, but uh, <laughs> I'll make sure you it's see very him cute. later. Um, so yeah, my children's book stuff, I've, I've got books about robots and octopus and i've got other ideas about sharks and things and and children and robots and octopuses together maybe you know like Ooh. godzilla and mecha godzilla came to together right. eventually that wasn't the plan <laughs> they ran out of ideas and made a robot one but you never know does your children's book have a shared universe you know i think so i could see there becoming yeah a, a dustin cinematic universe eventually oh i like that <laughs> that's a little farther than i actually thought ahead though um, yeah. Oh, actually, I was going to mention that you you mentioned the variety, uh, and he's very uh, you know you're very versatile, Dustin. I'm seeing not only humans, but you know the co comic y characters and the caricatures. Are all the things on the wall behind you? Or I know we'll go into it in more depth uh, later, but uh, are all those on sale on your website, or can we go to your website and buy those things? Those prints. Most of them. Um, the Conan O'Brien here, I can't sell. Uh, that's one that I did that got on the show, and they I had to sign up some, some rights to it for them to use it. <laughs> that's a whole cool story that I don't have time to tell today, but it got ended up being shown on the show, and then they used it for a, a gallery show in New York, and they did a 14-foot-tall version of that drawing. That's on front, awesome. On the front doors of the Time Warner building. Yeah, <laughs> that's been nine years ago, and nothing nearly that cool has happened to me since, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I think that might even be one of the the photos of you that we used to promote was you looking at it was a mural, right? Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. It was it was right across those windows, and yeah, I show that one a lot. Um, most of the stuff is is for sale somewhere. I'm I'm just now starting to put some of the children's book art up up on shirts and products and things like that. But uh, <laughs> there's uh you know a lot of the Marvel stuff that I do and Star Wars and things like that. Um, I've got for sale up on my T Public, but then once in a while the lawyer brigade comes through and takes down a bunch of things. So <laughs> I can't promise all of it's up there because some of it uh, had some ceases and desists, but. Well, that's okay because our chat has a lot of new ideas for you. They're all about this Octobot idea. Okay. They want an octopus robot. Um, and then Scott on YouTube uh, says in quotes, does this story follow Resh Cannon? Which I really like the sound of. <laughs> I like that too. Right, get that cinematic universe in there. <laughs> So uh, speaking of cons, before we kind of get into the demo, what has been, whether it's at Denver, we know you've been at Denver Pop Culture Con. What other shows have you, or have you exhibited at other shows? Just a few. Uh, I did Emerald City five or six years ago uh, in Seattle. And then mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, um, 
I did Dallas and Kansas City and Denver all in the same year, which oh, turns wow. out I, I have a full-time job and I was going to school at the time and that almost killed me having three shows. Um, and I've got, <laughs> I've got friends that do, you know, 30 a year, like, con, you know, con carnies. <laughs> <laughs> so what has been your, your like favorite con experience? What's like one thing that stands out as a, whether it's an awesome fan interaction or something crazy you saw, what's been your favorite con experience the funniest one i'm not going to tell you about yet because it's part of the slideshow i got coming up okay but uh my first year i got invited to do a, a panel um like on digital art versus traditional art that ended up being a lot of fun um there was uh there were a couple of traditional artists that are, were real well established that came in gunning for the, the you know the, the stylist people and uh, they weren't ready for somebody that was ready to argue and ended up being a, a really fun and lively panel <laughs> i had a, a blast at that um, I also, uh, you know, I do, I'll tend to do portraits of the people that are going to be guests at that show. Mm, yeah. And so I've, I've gotten to meet and get autographs from a lot of the, the, the David Tennant here was because he was going to be here this year. So that actually did that as a class assignment, but it was specifically because I was going to meet him and get that signed. Um, that's excellent. And, like bring uh, it, bring it up to him at the autograph booth. This one that's here on my shirt. I got Dave Batista to sign last year. And uh, yeah, anyway, that, so like getting to meet a lot of the celebrities that I've drawn has been fantastic. My whole living room is covered in autographed portraits of, of pop culture people, and that's that's been fantastic. Is Bruce, are we you... are we taking notes for future pop culture oh, yeah, comedies? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I, I was going to ask about the uh, Kaylee from Firefly. Uh, yeah. Jewel Kate. Is is that why you drew that one? Um, yeah, I'm actually I want that's one that I want to complete the set. So I've gotten now autographs um, from Alan Tudyk, Jewel State, Marina Becker, and uh, Nathan Fillion on two different things because I did a Doctor Horrible drawing of him also, and had him sign both of those. And um, let's see, Ron Glass is gone, but I, I'd like to complete that cast as much as I can eventually. Awesome. Um, so uh, yeah, Gina Torres and Adam Baldwin are the two main cast members I don't have yet. And that's uh, oh, I just blanked on on that, and and I got Summer Glau too. She, I I did get her signed. I'm I'm blanking on Simon's actor's name now, but he's also on the list that I don't have yet. I'm obsessed right now with Alan Tudyk in the Harley Quinn show, the animated Harley Quinn show, because he's Clayface and the Joker, and he just does such a phenomenal job. And back uh, there, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's a great role, too. I just finished watching, and I, I think this is a great nerd thing that probably doesn't have a lot of attention. It's it's on Hulu now. Um, it's Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency uh, as a show. Have you seen it? It's no. Cool. Uh, it's fantastic. It's, it's not really based on the books at all, other than the spirit and kind of the general, like, it's hard to explain. They went completely off script in a great way. So there's two seasons that are both nuts. The second one, Alan Tudyk is kind of one of the main bad guys in it. And he's so weird and so terrifying. And it's it's just so cool seeing how much he can adapt to that kind of thing. Yeah, we, we saw him at Reno Pop Culture Con uh, and he impersonated his chicken voice from Moana, which was phenomenal. It was I one bet. of the coolest things I've seen on that stage. Just seeing that come out of a human would be unreal. Right. <laughs> Well, Dustin, we've got you here for a workshop and a demo, and I know you've got some cool stuff. And if you're watching live, don't forget that later on, you will have an opportunity to influence Dustin's drawing and give him suggestions on how to create an unconventional superhero. But Dustin, I think you've got an unconventional superhero that you've kind of already created. So why don't you tell us about what you got and, and show off this new character? I will. Uh, let me start the screen share. And then, of course, we got Liz behind the scenes. Liz is making this whole show work. Uh, so if we're having any audio issues or if you notice anything like that live, let us know and Liz can get that fixed. And she is going to make Dustin's art look amazing. Shout out to Liz. Come on, little iPad, you can do it. <laughs> okay. Is Next everybody slide. seeing my iPad screen? It looks like it, right? I can see it. Uh, whether okay. our viewers can see it, that's another yes, question. But it looks like they can. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to start just with a quick slideshow to get uh, get the origin story out of the way. Um, so this is a kind of a sample of the children's book illustration stuff that I've got. Uh, the this top center one, I actually did the sketch of it in the ocean while scuba diving, and that's something I would love to come and do a whole show about sometime. That I'm I'm trying to pioneer dive drawing, 
Did, so was it uh, digital and you had it like in a... a no, a plastic slate with an actual graphite pencil for the sketch part. And then huh. on, the pla on the plane home from St. Lucia, I was using this iPad and I did the painting version. I've got a, a YouTube time lapse of the whole thing. Uh, That's that amazing. Can, where can, where can people find that? Um, on YouTube, on my, my Resha Sketch channel. But I'll make Resha. sure that we... Uh, <laughs> That's the, kudos on locking that name down. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's something I want to do lots more of. But um, let's see. I'm trying to use the mouse on the iPad. Let's keep these things straight. Um, and then this is uh, more of a sample of the stuff that I usually do for the cons, right? The uh, traditional superheroes. So when you guys were asking me about you know ex the unusual superheroes. I'm thinking, how do we go in a really different di different direction from these guys? And uh, I was talking to um, my group of my children's book friends. We all, all have critique group meetings, and we were brainstorming about what would be a good unconventional superhero. And we decided that a child version of me might be a funny one to do because I'm the opposite of a superhero. <laughs> um, what, do you, so what do you mean by that? I'm, uh, I'm about to tell you. So I was I was saying that, that I uh, managed to get a letter in trivia in high school. That's what this uh, the picture on the right is from my freshman yearbook from our knowledge bowl team that by my senior year I ended up taking to state. We were a very small school and it was a big deal to to get that far. Um, and uh, yeah, my my superpower I, art isn't in my top couple because that's not something that I'm naturally good at at all. Um, I was a really good student in. Uh, for example, in high school, I got straight A's in everything but art and gym. Um, so okay. specifically, spelling is my biggest superpower. It's something that I, I don't even know why I'm good at it, but I just always have been. Um, so the spellcaster that you talked about is going to come from that that part of my background. As um, a, a former first grade teacher, having an innate spelling ability is pretty incredible. Like that's I, I, I'm not sure where that could come from having taught, you know, phonics and, and those concepts. That's awesome. Yeah, the, this drawing right here is my dad teaching me how to read when I was, I think I wasn't two yet when he was doing this. He would write words on these blocks of wood. And if I could read all four sides, then I get to throw the wood in the fire. That was my, my prize, which I think is going to be part of this character's origin story, like how that gets converted into magic, right? Parents take note. That's awesome. Right. <laughs> um, so for the my tragic origin story, uh, it's going to, my character's going to end up being younger than this, but in, in eighth grade was my last year of eligibility. I finally made it to the state spelling bee. And uh, I was so ready for nationals at that point. Like I was studied up. I knew all my, my roots. And then I got the dumbest word I've ever heard of being in a spelling bee uh, dropped on me and it knocked me out. And uh, I've, I've drawn some pictures for therapy. Um, and I got what is basically a Batman sound effect as a word. You know, I didn't get sphygmomanometer or onomatopoeia. I got womp. Aardvark. <laughs> I got womp from a guy with a southern accent and a mush mouth, and I couldn't tell what vowel he was saying, no matter how he defined it, how he pronounced it, how he get, used it in a sentence. And uh, so as you can see from the banner, that was 33 years ago, and I legitimately still can't talk about it without getting angry. I, so I can't even, like, what does that word even mean? How do you use it's, that in it's, a sentence? It's the sound of something being dropped. One, one is the sound of something being dropped, and the other one's a thud, like something being closed. It's it's so close as to be excruciating to talk about. Um, you got the womp with an O? It's funny. I, this is such a traumatic thing that I don't know which was the correct one to this day. <laughs> I, I know I spelled the other one uh, than what they were expecting, and I, I lost my... That was my last chance for nationals, and I don't know oh, for sure man. which one it was. I believe that they wanted womp, and I spelled womp. Um, I don't know if my mom's watching this, but she'll probably remember and correct me. Um, mom, if you're in the chat, let us know. <laughs> uh, so uh, for more of the origin story, then my first year uh, exhibiting at the con, I had my first ever superhero cosplay. Uh, my friend Dave wore a bald cap, got some fake like empty glasses, grew his beard out, just to uh, cosplay as me. So that's him on the left, dressed as me as a hero, like convention art guy, right? Um, but he's somebody that had been with me for like some grown up spelling bees at bars and stuff like that. And so he knew the my darkest secret. He knew the womp story. And so this last year he had a new costume and he decided to show up as my arch nemesis 
and he's, <laughs> he he showed up as Doctor Womp. He's he's my bad guy. Um, That's incredible. Part of what inspired the idea of making this hero, like I said, plus just what's more unconventional than a tiny kid that can't run fast or jump high or do anything but spell words well. <laughs> uh, and uh, so from that, like he's definitely going to be the actual bad guy if I ever get this into story form and graphic novel form. And I just, this was so funny and so mean at the same time that I wanted to make sure he got some, some airplay. Um, well, there's a lot of uh, people sympathizing for you in the chat. They totally understand. <laughs> and they're sharing their own terrifying spelling bee uh, experiences. Also, your wife says hello. Hi, Stephanie. Oh, good. Uh, she, she's probably making fun of me the loudest. Um, <laughs> That's their job, right? That's the spouse's job. And if I didn't have these headphones on, I would hear her laughing at me from upstairs right now. Um, so yeah, so my, my friends that uh, worked on me with the idea, my my squibby friends from my children's book group, I, I asked if they could have their kids do some cloak poses for me uh, to use as, as reference. So this is some of what I got back are these fantastic uh, homemade cloaks. And I was saying, hey, if you could throw something quick together with a blanket, and they were all like, oh, we have cloaks. Like every single one of them had at least a Hogwarts cloak or a full witch cloak or whatever. I was gonna say, I'm um, pretty sure I wore one of these when I was 11 for Halloween. Right. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this is what I got back for reference, which is all fantastic. I'm gonna be able to use that for lighting and things like that. And so I did a bunch of sketches for, th this is all since you guys asked me about the unconventional superhero. I I've been trying to come up with what does the spellcaster look like because I know that his power is going to be that he can conjure things out of thin air if he can spell them. Oh, that's cool. And uh, so I had the idea of this uh, crossword cloak that would, you know, sh maybe show the word that he's spelling as he's spelling it. It's just a plain cloak until he starts using his power, and then it shows up with all the letters on it as he's spelling them. And so, you know, if if he gets distracted in mid conjure, he could create the wrong thing, and they could, you know, like falling off a building and he's trying to spell trampoline and spells it wrong it turns into something else and you hit the Gasoline. ground so you have to get yeah <laughs> um yeah exactly or parachute and it turns into i had some good ideas for this i didn't write them down <laughs> <laughs> i, I <laughs> mean the, uh, the opportunities are endless right and uh yeah so you know i'll have dr womp in there like throwing my bad memories at me and uh the my villains would be throwing distractions at, at the little hero and things like that um, so yeah, I had all that source material and, uh, so we're almost up to what I actually want to work on and let's make sure that screen changes. Okay. Uh, and so I was thinking about for reference also, um, I have a bunch of little mannequins for drawing and I have a child one. So I built a cloak for this guy so that I can do poses, um, so that's what I actually am going to end up using as my reference. Uh, so I like I like that you're you're kind of explaining this because I know for someone who like me who is not a gifted artist, when I see crazy poses in a comic book or a piece of art, I'm always wondering how the artist puts that together. And so you're using an actual action figure here to give you kind of the position of the body. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and things like the way that that shadow falls across the face is, is great, right? Mm. You know, I mean, I'll set up things with lighting and staging. Uh, you'd be amazed at some of the stuff I had to set up for the children's book illustrations in grad school. Like I had dioramas, full on dioramas, or you have people act stuff out and do real costumes. Um, there are plenty of comic book artists that are well trained enough that they can draw their character in any pose. I'm, I'm a little bit more of a realistic artist anyway. And so I actually do depend on photo reference uh, quite a bit. Um, so I did this sketch last night based on this picture of the, of the uh, little figure. So this is going to be where I start. And I hope I didn't use up too much of the demo time. Yeah, nah, this but, is your uh, show, dude. So I'm going to work from, from this loose sketch. Um, and I'm going to try it with, uh, this is Art Studio Pro on the iPad. Um, I have lots and lots of friends that use use and love Procreate also. Mm -hmm. The main reason I like this one is because it's closest to Photoshop, which is what I've been using for 20 years to, uh, to paint in. And once you know one software, it's relatively, would you say it's simple to kind of switch between softwares? Are the tools kind of similar or they what's can been be your experience there? 
I would think if you came up on something like uh, Corel Painter, like a, a real media, kind of a realistic, made for artists more than for designers kind of a tool, mm. then mm. something like Procreate is going to feel more natural. It feels more like you're taking real brushes out of, uh, out of a drawer and use them. This is, is more like a software, but that's just because I, I design for a living. I've been using Photoshop forever and ever on the Wacom tablets. And um, yeah, I, I think that you definitely, a lot of the, the concepts will translate uh, w relatively well. Uh, it right. depends on, on how easily you get distracted by things being in a slightly different place. Uh, a brand new update just came out two days ago for this, and I don't know where anything is in this software. <laughs> And you're going to find joys out when I of, start trying to click stuff that doesn't want to work. Yeah, the joys of constantly updating software. Dion, who is actually one of our cast members for our comic show and one of our instructors as well, who's going to be teaching our Photoshop course, he says iPad is definitely going to be my next mobile device for arting. <laughs> I like that verb, Dion. It's crazy. I, I've been using the the you know tablets that are disconnected where you're not drawing on the screen you're seeing. And then I ended up teaching on the big wacom tablet where you're the cintiq where you're drawing right on the image and i got spoiled and i had to get one and then i got a portable one of those which was several thousand dollars for a portable tablet it was great but it was heavy and battery didn't last very long and the ipads are so good now and the software is so good and the apple pencil is insane and this isn't there's two new versions since the one i have oh okay uh, i bought this one refurbished because i didn't know if i'd love it but it turns out i don't use my fancy tablets much anymore because uh, I can work at full, like I'm, I'm working at 5,000 by 4,000 pixels on this thing right now. Mm. And it's plenty fast and keeping up. So uh, talking about method and things like that, I do, uh, when I traditionally sketch, I almost always work on a toned paper of one kind or another. I, I have a lot of tan sketchbooks. I will buy a manila paper and bind my own sketchbooks out of them. It's, it's a lot more common to be able to find like gray and tan books now. Uh, so you know, I don't have to custom make them quite so often. But then I, I work in like Prismacolor um, with just not full color uh, colored pencils, but I'm working with uh, like a darker version of the color that the paper is. And then with whites to be able to kind of pop highlights back out. And you guys will see how that works here digitally in a minute because I, I tend to do the same thing, even when it's going to be a full color painting. Mm. Um, that's how I tend to start so that um, I'm starting with medium value and uh but then i can pull back and push forward both right it's, it's a lot easier to get dimension i probably made this you guys can tell that this is a blue background right yes um it's probably lighter than i'm going to want it to be we'll see how the white lays down on it um but if you see up here like i always start with this value strip that i drag in and set to a luminosity layer mode so that uh, it's going to just give me variations of the same color that I started with. Because I'll start green, I'll start purple. It just depends on what I'm in the mood for, what feels right for that character, that sort of thing. Um, I definitely don't like that I uh, started with the character like looking straight at the viewer. So I want to redo the face, I think, as we're sketching this in here. And uh, I want to have him looking toward where his hand is conjuring. Mm. Um, so I've got that under sketch, but it was really just for, uh, for layout and for concept. And I liked what the cloak did enough in the, the little mannequin picture that I want to actually use it and the shadows from it, uh, in the final. In that mannequin, what material is that cloak made out of? I cut a square out of an old white t-shirt. Okay. <laughs> and it's, so the awesome thing is at that size, it ended up being stiff enough that it like. It looks like I've got wires in it to make it. That was up, my question. Yes. Yeah, how did you make it keep that shape? It's still keeping that shape. And you saw me picking it up and showing it to you. Um, it's just, it's thick enough fabric at that scale that it stands up on its own. Obviously it doesn't when you're wearing it. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just t-shirt fabric. That's kind of making its own shape and it's still there two days later. That's crazy. Um, one of the ideas that I was having, I mean, I, I wear glasses in real life and I have for a long, long, long time, but, uh, I had fantastic vision until I was about eight and then it all went to hell and um, I've had to wear these ever since. But uh, one of the ideas was to try a, a reverse Clark Kent for this character. Like when he's in his secret identity, you know, six you got or however old. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, or the glasses aren't actually for vision, they're for, mm. you know, who knows, like virtual reality or something. Um, 
but yeah, so glasses are part of the disguise, not part of the secret identity. You know, that's funny because when I was in about third grade, so about nine years old, the reason I, we, my family found out that I needed glasses is because I would write our spelling words down incorrectly. Our teacher would write that week's spelling test words on the whiteboard and I'd bring them home and my mom would be like, what is this? What, what are you writing down? Why can't you write it down right? It's because I could not see. Come to find out. Right? It's a hard thing to communicate when you're a kid. I didn't know. Right. Um, all right. I want to switch to one of these new pencil tools that I'm experimenting with uh, that came with this new version. Because this takes advantage of the tilt function. So I, I can draw real tight little pencil lines with this. Um, but then laying it on its side a little bit, which I realize the camera is not showing you. But uh, I have it tilted way over. And it's mm -hmm. letting me shade like, uh, like a tilted graphite pencil. It's pretty cool. So what I find interesting, because we're talking about developing unconventional superheroes, right? Mm -hmm. When you started with this character, you didn't necessarily start with the superpower or the look. You started with the backstory, and you let the backstory kind of influence all of those things, like the, the cape and the look and the superpower. Um, is that how you approach most of your characters, or how do, how do you do that? I would say I usually have a, a story in mind first. It, it's hard to say. Like my, my first, my robot children's book, the first version of it popped into my head while I was swimming laps one day. And I wrote a whole rhyming children's book in my head while I was swimming. And I have no short-term memory whatsoever. Um, so I had to jump out of the pool, go find a piece of paper to write on, <laughs> like running through the the 24 hour fitness, asking people <laughs> for a sheet of paper so I could write it down before it fell out of my brain. Um, so that one, I just, I really just kind of uh, envision this is too slow. Go back to a more comfortable tool. Um, but then like the octopus book one, which is my, my favorite one that I really want to sell. It's absolutely a true story. And it, it just came from, you know, the way that that went down and what I wanted to do with that character. Um, I can ramble about that if you like, or we can keep talking about technique stuff, but. Yeah, why don't you give us a little bit more as you're kind of finishing up a little bit more about how you developed this character, maybe where the idea of the cape came from, or even how you would draw this character. And then in a couple of minutes, we'll move into where our audience can give you suggestions for creating a new character. Crowdsourcing. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to be a lot farther along with this guy than I am. I'm glad I pre sketched him. So I didn't just end up with nothing during our stream. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's the process. Lot. A lot of this came about all in that first brainstorm session with my friends talking about it. Like if I was going to make my little nerdy butt into a superhero, what would the power be? And, and spelling, like I, I really, I have weird magic proofreading powers. I can walk behind somebody who's typing and not even read the text they're typing and I'll see the typos. <laughs> I don't, I don't understand it. It comes from the swaddling clothes of the planet I was born on or something. Um, Dude, I'm trying to grab a, a, a light color here to start from. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I was talking like, you know, could it? Weird. Um, you know, would it be like a spelling-based, you know, strength superhero? Could it be a somebody who flies and spells? But it, then I don't know if it was me or one of my friends who said, you know, what about if he casts spells? And then we had a bunch of funny ideas, like enough to make a graphic novel out of, um, like I said, the misadventures of, of having stuff happen that you're uh, trying to spell as you're falling off a building, things like that. Now, is the spellcaster, because you mentioned that if he spells something incorrectly, he can't uh, conjure it, right? So mm -hmm. is the spellcaster innately a good speller? Or is he using that ability to help him, help him learn how to be, become a better speller? I think he's innately a good speller. He studies it and the, like I said, I want it to be a power that he already had, but then one day, I don't know if it's maybe the magic crossword cloak or whatever that unlocks the magic part of it. That's what he's having to learn, but it's turning out, you know, like with practical use, being able to, uh, to learn to do things under intense pressure uh, would, would be a big part of it. Mm. Um, you know, having to make up like fighting crime against, you know, like that big strong Dr. Wump jerk um 
you know, fighting like powered superheroes without having any physical powers. You have to get creative and you have to get uh, get imaginative with something like that. Um, so, yeah, I think most likely he would already be a spelling bee contestant and a, a big nerd and a bullied nerd for sure. I would want to do a lot about, uh, you know, you have a, a, a kid that becomes a hero and, you know, you can't give away how powerful you've become to the kids at your school but you also are gaining in confidence in the real world and you're not going to not going to take it anymore. Um, so I envision that being a big part of that journey. Definitely. Yeah. And, you know, discovering how this is an unconventional super power. It's not like this is how you see people being helped on a day-to-day basis. So as the spellcaster learns more about how does his specific superpower fit into the world and make the world a better place, that's a, a cool journey. Yeah, I mean, it, it's all, it all started as a silly idea, just like what kind of funny thing could I demo for you guys? But just talking about it, there's a lot of potential, I think, for uh, for real stories. Like, even if it's just to make the memory of 12-year-old me feel better. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I also know there's lots and lots of kids out there, you know, that are same kind of thing, that are academically inclined and not physically inclined and mm-hmm. deserve to have confidence too, you know? Yeah. There's also uh, a lot of students, hopefully there's a lot of students looking in and uh, watching your technique. I think it's important to say, you guys, you're working on Art Studio Pro, Pro for the iPad, but this doesn't require, this kind of drawing and everything, this technique doesn't require special tools. You can just pick up a pencil and paper. Absolutely. I'm, I'm specifically kind of trying to emulate the way that I work with, with color pencils. Um. I have a stack of stuff sitting next to the computer that I've drawn on these scraps of cardboard in the little window. But you can see I work with the the white pencil and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Right on the cardboard. So yeah, it's the way that I sketch is based on the way I sketch on paper. You're absolutely right. It doesn't have to be high tech or or expensive. Um, You know, the way that I get into doing color stuff does get more high tech and expensive. Um, Mm -hmm. Some of it's pretty elaborate. But I almost always start out like this, just just like I would on uh, with colored pencil on a toned paper. Bruce, are you ready to take some audience suggestions? We've already gotten a few. Uh, let's start. Let's start anew and do that. Excellent. So, audience, if you are watching live, now is your opportunity to give us some ideas in the chat of a unique superhero that Dustin can draw for us. And Bruce is going to take those ideas and he's going to cure your ideas and put them into a package for Dustin to, to draw here. And while we get those ideas there and while Dustin is finishing up, I'm going to tell you guys about a new program that we have going on at Pop Culture Classroom, which is our brand new boot camps. So the PopStream workshop that you're watching right now is not the only opportunity for you to build new skills. Pop Culture Classroom, the educational nonprofit behind Denver Pop Culture Con, has opened registration for a new series of virtual boot camps. If you're looking to learn more about Photoshop, uh, comic book creation, streaming, or Dungeons and Dragons, then this is your opportunity to learn from professionals and build some community. So classes will meet once per week for five weeks. And in addition to getting instruction from professionals, you'll also get curated courses, um, curated activities and resources to help reinforce the skills that you're learning in between classes. And you get to meet some really cool people while you're at it. So classes are for ages 16 and up and there are a limited number of scholarships available. So make sure that if you would like to apply for a scholarship, you do that early. And because these boot camps are virtual, it doesn't matter where you live, the magic of the internet will let you participate from anywhere. So you can learn more about our boot camps at popcultureclassroom.org slash camps. And once again, that is popcultureclassroom.org slash camps. All right. I'm seeing some awesome stuff in the chat already. Bruce, what do we got? Well, so far, uh, Scott Pantall suggested the invisible man, but- uh, I'm done. <laughs> that one's easy, right? So for the second one, okay, uh, Heather Brockman Lee says a unicorn that makes popcorn, flame tail, frying pan wings, corn comes off the corn and pops on the wings. This is from her 10-year-old. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, absolutely guys, could have come from either of them, <laughs> and it wouldn't have surprised me at all. 
I don't know if you guys watched Lego Masters. Uh, it's on Hulu right now, but there was an episode where the kids suggested what the people would build out of Legos, and that sounds exactly like what we would have gotten. <laughs> the, uh, I, uh, Stan Yan and uh, several other people have suggested, based on your life story, uh, the the um, Roboctopus uh, or yeah. uh, Octobot. Okay. So, yeah, we see Roboctopus, and then there's also a variation on that, which is Roboctomom, uh, which would be... <laughs> <laughs> and maybe she one. she has popcorn. Yeah, so we've got all these <laughs> awesome ideas. So what do you think, Dustin, would make the most interesting superhero here? Well, yeah, I, I love the idea of combining those ideas. Yeah. Um, I, w- I want to do the robot octopus as quickly as we can, and it's going to have a unicorn horn, too, just to, to make <laughs> it, make Emmy happy also. Yes. Um, okay. Let's just start making a mess. Will the unicorn <laughs> horn uh, shoot out um, lasers or popcorn? Uh, it depends if this is an actual like underwater octopus. Popcorn really gets soggy fast, in my experience. Yeah, that or is at true. Le- or at least in my face, it gets soggy real fast. <laughs> um, I'm drawing my regular octopus i was going to give him cool robot eyes and i immediately started doing pupils um yeah we want to make these look like headlights of some kind um we'll have some auxiliary sensory organs and get that unicorn horn in there early so i don't forget now i want everyone watching to notice that when you're initially getting these ideas on paper it doesn't have to be perfect, right? Dustin, you said, well, let's just slap some stuff down, right? It's never been perfect on my first try. Right. Um, yeah, that's, I, I, I've seen people do it. That's something that they've drawn before and have a lot of practice at, I think, usually. Um, well, I think for a lot of people, especially younger people, if they are not comfortable with their drawing ability, that's what stops them. Is they, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, the feeling that like, oh, this is terrible. I, I can promise you I've drawn many tens of thousands of things and every single one of them went through a oh this is gross i hate this face every single one um it it gets (laughs) ugly you know you start out uh with a great idea and i am i've been working for a long time to get any good at this when i was 30 i was a terrible artist i mean i'm I'm finally done enough school and gotten better uh, enough at this in my advanced age that uh I'm more confident, but yeah, it's, it's always experimentation. And unless you already know what you're drawing or you're, you know, if I'm drawing a specific portrait from a specific photo, for example, then it it still goes through an ugly phase. Don't get me wrong, Mm -hmm. but I'm, you know, I'm not necessarily trying to figure out the whole time what I'm going to end up with. Right. Um, Yeah. Scott on YouTube says the only way to get better at any skill, whether it's drawing, writing, or programming is to keep doing it. There's a misconception that art is uh, uh, an innate skill and all artists are born great artists. And you might be born with some talent, but it's a skill you got to learn and practice just like anything else. I believe in that so thoroughly. And that's that's something that I, that I was trying to get across in the, the earlier thing. I, I really didn't, all my, all my talents were for things like reading and writing and math and stuff like that. I was bad at art. It's hard for me to, to even, even now to be good other than I've got a lot of practice now. Um, See what the audience thinks. Do these look too much like crab legs? Should I start over with something a little more <laughs> tentacly? I, I kind of like that. Yeah, they. So if you're an audio listener right now, so far we've got the robotic head, and you can kind of see the metallic lines on there. We do have the unicorn horn, which someone in the chat suggested maybe the unicorn is to keep the popcorn above the water so that it doesn't actually get soggy. Really? Uh, I thought that was an interesting idea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, And then uh, we've got some, we've got four octopus tentacles so far, which of course are mechanical because this is the robotic octopus or the Roboticus. I I can't even say that now. Keep keep trying. (laughs) Robotic. Roboctopus. (laughs) I'm not helping you either. (laughs) What did I do? I turned my opacity all the way down by accident. Uh, someone says it's kind of a mix of crab, octopus, and unicorn. Yeah. Uh, that's Defender Null on Twitch. Uh, so I figure it's going to be a little bit like Dr. Octopus, where these joints here uh, can expand out into full tentacles, mm. right? So this is someone, one reaching yes, with. Someone did suggest at least one ridiculously long tentacle, so that expanding part can definitely achieve that goal. 
wherever you are, I read your mind. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that you know they're they're going to be versatile, right? Octopus can do amazing things and have all kinds of superpowers, which is a big part of the, the book that I wrote that I'm trying to sell. Uh, is about the amazing powers that they have for camouflage and being able to fit through crazy things. Jesus Pe Peaches in the chat, you got jokes. <laughs> they say, instead of popcorn, can you make the corn on the cob, but instead of the cob, it's a hot dog. That's uh, why, why couldn't we just make it a hot dog? That also reminds me of the Rick and Morty episode where everything is on the cob and Rick just starts freaking out. <laughs> Excellent stuff. So what, what do we think, and maybe the chat can help us out here, what do we think the backstory of, uh, now somebody's calling this Crab Octacorn, what do we think the backstory I'm of sorry to whoever that was be? that I just took the crab legs away. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but only a little bit sorry, because I think we're going to be happier with what we get now. It was starting to remind me of the Kevin Smith story about when he pitched to John Peters the... Uh, the Superman, his Superman script. Yeah. You guys know that? Mm -mm. And uh, John Peters wanted uh, the villain to have spider mechanical, giant spider mechanical legs. Mm. Uh, and so Kevin Smith bowed out of that one, but John Peters finally got that for Wild Wild West. I was about to say, I'm pretty sure I remember that from Wild Wild West. Yeah. And that came out great. <laughs> I've actually I've actually heard Kevin Smith tell part of that story. <laughs> That's that was going to be the one that had like Nicolas Cage attached to it right. as, as Kal El, right. right? That's funny. All I've right, got, so I've, I've got a signed portrait of Kevin Smith that when I got to meet him also. Oh man, that would be a treat. Uh, I saw was, he was interviewing Gerard Way about comics, and this was years ago. But I was like, man, just to be in that room. Yeah, he's incredible. I, I was a spoken word at the Comedy Works here in Denver that I got huh. to meet him. So we got to spend a few minutes really just chatting afterwards. And all well, these arms are all over the place. He doesn't look like a good guy. I think the robot octopus might be, a, might be a villain or so, just misunderstood. <laughs> so yeah, so chat, you got to come through with some of the backstory. Has this character always been a robot? Did it go through an accident that turned it into a robot? Was it an invisible man that then had an accident that turned him into a robot octopus? There it is. Huh. No, somebody's got something better than that. <laughs> yeah, well, Jesus Peacher, Peaches says, instead of the popcorn, can you make the corn on the cob, make it corn on the cob? But instead of the cob, it's a hot dog. That's a, that's a tall order. You guys are <laughs> obsessed with the food part of this, which I wasn't even planning on getting to, except for maybe <laughs> a kernel of popcorn, but I may have to stop drawing legs and start drawing food. <laughs> I like this. This is good. It's definitely feeling robot-y, isn't it? Um, let's see. So if somebody, you, let's say the spellcaster, came yep. across this character and this character had popcorn cops as arms, yep. perhaps the spellcaster could summon a microwave exactly um, to defeat this character. I love it. And to be able to spell... Like Architutus, like a, he could spell the, the Latin name for the giant squid to defeat the, the octopus with a much bigger uh, cephalopod. There's always a bigger fish. That's right. <laughs> There's always a bigger kaiju, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Heather suggests uh, maybe this character is made in a factory and put in a box, but then the truck bumped on a rock and the box fell into a river. He escapes the box and starts swimming around and learning the ways of sea life. I love that. And that's from uh, the daughter, it looks like. Uh, then Stan suggests, Octopi are from space. The robot body originated as the space vessel. And when they arrived Ooh. on Earth, they repurposed the spacecraft to be android servants. So it was just kind of like a space suit almost. It was armor, but now they put artificial intelligence into them and they're on the loose. I like it. Space octopus keep coming up. This is only episode two of in yeah. Pop Stream, and this is the second episode in a row that space octopus have come come up. Because of course, in the Umbrella Academy, that's the opening panel of the first issue, and then we talked about how that related to Watchmen. Uh, yeah. So perhaps uh, Ozzy Man just summoned this character, and then <laughs> it was repurposed into a, an octopus when they discovered it could not live on Earth. I like it. It at least proves that it, they're in the same universe. 
Right. Yeah. Well, that means I'm probably going to get sued before this podcast. <laughs> I accidentally stole intellectual property or you guys stole it for me. And I'm naming everybody in the chat as def- co-defendants if that happens. <laughs> so fun story about that. Uh, there's a video game coming out that was supposed to be called Gods and Monsters. Monster Energy uh, gave them a cease and desist because they said they had the trademark on monster used in video games. And so that game, Gods and Monsters, is now called Phoenix Immortals Rising, which is a very a, a downgrade for sure. That but makes me Monster sad. Energy, right? <laughs> they better come out with a really cool game and make some use out of that trademark, and they're not just doing it for spite. Right. That's not cool. I think they had a BMX, mon- like Monster Energy BMX game, and then uh, Death Stranding by Hideo Kojima, which was released earlier earlier this year, last year, um, heavily featured Monster Energy product placement. <laughs> okay. Well, at least at least that person probably got paid and didn't violate copyright. So as we are finishing up, we've got about four or five more minutes as we're finishing creating this character what else is going through your mind as you're creating this unconventional superhero and or super villain what, um, what other things should we think about well i like the backstory stuff i mean definitely uh, we can definitely use him as a, a villain in the, the spellcaster world and it might be that once he figures out how to reprogram it it wasn't a villain in the first place it was just a misunderstood space octopus Mm-hmm. artificial intelligent robot demon unicorn <laughs> pop- popcorn launcher um, <laughs> i encourage people to think about absurdity a lot because that's what i do the whole time i'm drawing is like how silly is this thing that i'm trying to do right now and the other thing too is is once again with your technique want everybody to see that essentially you're drawing on blue paper right. and instead of shadowing you're highlighting with whiteness which could be like uh, liquid paper or something like that absolutely white color pencil honestly is 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 my favorite superpower weapon or superhero weapon is the prism color white color pencil it covers everything it'll even cover over ink if you're drawing in ink it's uh it's fantastic i think that's a great starting point for anybody who wants to it, it's it when i discovered it, it was almost like a cheat code for dimensionality right like i would do life drawing and then just with a little bit of that white on a toned paper, I could make it do things that I would have had to shade everything and erase back out with charcoal or something, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's my favorite shortcut, which is why I still use it on the computer. <laughs> Got some bubbles cool. alongside with the popcorn. And what, what was the hot dog thing? I might as well try it. They suggested that, I believe they said, instead of popcorn, it's corn on the cob, but instead of the cob, it's a hot dog. So I think Jesus Peaches was suggesting that a hot dog in the middle, but covered in popcorn. Corn on the dog. Hey, the there dog. you go, Bruce. So is the, is the, okay, the unpopped kernels are a condiment on the hot dog, uh, which mm, we're going to happen. And so these pieces of popcorn, rather than instead of, it's just before it becomes, uh, this laser then can heat up the, the kernels. Um, and you know they're sitting here on the bun on the hot dog, but then as you hit them with the laser, they can become huge kernels that become dangerous to our hero. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna have a corn on the dog <laughs> that then the unicorn laser can. Uh, and I mean, if if you're if the villains really trying for like a boss battle evil, there also will be relish and stuff on the popcorn. It won't be pretty mm, at some all. Some sauerkraut. Yeah. Oh. Our friend Stan Yan says that the horn is uh, for holding over the campfire. <laughs> also, that horn is very multi-purpose at this point. I like it. And yeah. I kind of envision like the horn also transforms almost like a uh, Inspector Gadget, Go-Go Gadget type thing. And says, <laughs> it extends. It's not like you don't have eight infinitely extendable and prehensile arms already. You need that, that horn to... <laughs> right, yeah. That, that's for the, the extra special reach. <laughs> Like well, Dustin, it. as you're finishing this up, what would you like to promote? Where would you like to direct people to find your work? That is a great question. Uh, the quickest place is probably just to go to DustinRush.com because that's got links to both sites. I have a whole separate site for the portrait and superhero stuff, and then the Rush of Sketch is for the children's book stuff. But you can get to all of it from DustinRush.com. 
and then I've got social media tags for both separately <laughs> for everything. But yeah, I encourage, I mean, follow my Instagram, my Twitter, and my Facebook, and I post the stuff up all of the time. Excellent. And I am looking forward to the Resh canon, the Resh shared universe coming soon. I don't know about how soon, but I'm going to be working on it. I, I want to see more about Spellcaster and, and Octobot or whatever we decide. <laughs> Me too. I legitimately was thinking this was going to be really silly, but I'm falling in love with this villain. I think I he's like it. great. I hey, this is where the best ideas come from. It's just pure, pure silliness, just throwing yeah. things out. Brainstorming with the crowd. It's wonderful. Well, if you've been joining us live today, thank you guys so much for your ideas, for your feedback. And if you are listening after the fact, we hope that you are going to like and subscribe and share, whether you're on YouTube or whether you're finding us on a podcast service. We've got lots of st awesome stuff coming from Pop PopStream in the future. One of the things we do have coming is reader mail. We want to have as many opportunities as possible to interact with you guys. So if you have a question for the cast of any of our shows, if you want to share how one of our guests like Dustin helped or inspired your art creation that we can share on the show, you can do that at PopStream at popcultureclassroom.org. And once again, that is popstream at popcultureclassroom.org. Drop us an email, say hi, and let us know what's going on. And hopefully we can feature you on the next show. And on next month's episode of the Popstream Workshop, because these are once monthly, we're going to have a cosplay demo just in time to get you guys an Instagram-worthy Halloween costume and talk you through the steps of how does one start a cosplay or a new costume from scratch. So like I said, we've got all kinds of awesome pop stream content coming at you soon. Next week, we've got the first episode of the pop stream AV club. We'll be talking all about Amazon Prime's The Boys. Following that, we've got the pop stream Denver Pop Culture Con flashback, where we're talking about the science of Wakanda and showing that panel. Bruce, was that from last year's Denver Pop Culture Con 2019? It was. Science of yes. Wakanda. Excellent. And then after that, we'll be starting the whole thing over again. So again, please subscribe on YouTube, subscribe on Twitch, subscribe on podcast services to make sure you get all the latest content. And don't forget to check out our boot camps if you want to develop a few more skills at popcultureclassroom.org slash camps. And then the last thing I will ask of you guys is that Pop Culture Classroom is a nonprofit located here in Denver. We're an educational nonprofit and our whole mission is to increase liter literacy inspire a love of learning and celebrate diversity through pop culture. And whether that is workshops that we're doing here in the Denver area, boot camps that you can access from everywhere, educating people at Denver Pop Culture Con, or even creating resources for teachers all across the nation. Any donation you could give us would be extremely helpful. So on the screen, you should be able to see a donate link. Uh, and if you're listening to our audio only version, you can go to popcultureclassroom.org to find our donate link. Dustin, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for bringing your talents to our show. It's been so much fun. I want to see everybody who's listening on audio. I want to see your version of what you think that this uh, octopus thing looked like. Yes. Send it into the stream and, and let them share it. Yeah, you can send your versions just from our descriptions. You can draw it out and send that to pop culture, or excuse me, popstream at popcultureclassroom.org, or you can share it on social media at Pop Culture Classroom or Denver Pop Culture Cons, uh, Facebook. Instagram, or Twitter. Bruce, thank you for joining us. We will see you in a couple weeks for the Denver Pop Culture Con flashback. Thank you. And, and everybody, you. yep, and everybody joining us and listening, thank you for being here. And until next time, this has been your pop stream, and we'll see you in a week. Y'all take care. Thank you, everybody. Bye.